The magic of the tarot is that it is a book with no binding, no cover, no stitching, no glue. All of the pages are loose, and all of them can be shuffled into any order at any time. Even putting the cards back in order is something that you must do arbitrarily. You're the one who chooses the order that they are put back into at all. The first 22 cards of the tarot tell a story that is essential for not just occult initiates to know, but for anyone who chooses to use the tarot to learn anything. They must learn the initial story of it. Because as the initial story is told and retold and retold again, this is how the cards communicate with us. The first card in the Major Arcana is the Fool. Because it is numbered zero, one can arrive at the Fool at any time. It is completely able to go out of numerical sequence and to insert itself into any numerical sequence that already exists. The Fool is a state that we can always go back to and always leave at any time, and it is a very useful state. You could consider the Fool to be a pun. A Fool is someone whose head is too full to be filled with any more information. So if you find yourself being a Fool, it's time to go out and empty your head so that it can be filled again. You can see here the fool has gone out into nature. The fool is being reminded by their dog to experience this nature and let in the real knowledge from the sun that is coming from above them, to let in illumination from what is around the fool, not cloud that illumination with what is inside the fool's head, which in a way is nothing. This is the conundrum of the fool. We are always a fool, and we almost always must remind ourselves that we are always the fool. This is why it is at number zero. Now that we have emptied our heads of knowledge by becoming the fool, we can become the magician and, our, and fill our heads once again. The magician points out the truth of magic, which is that all of the tools on the table before the magician are completely useless. Even the wand that the magician is holding into the sky is completely useless. The magician is pointing to what is actually useful for magic, where the magic comes from, where one must actually focus their attentions if they are to grow as a magician. In fact, the wand is even pointing up at the same thing. The magician is pointing down to the plants. The plants from the ground contain all of the poisons and all of the cures and all of the power that a magician will ever use. The plants are nature itself demonstrating to a magician how chemistry works, how magic works, how life works, how balance works, how death and destruction works, how creation works. By regarding the nature around you and letting the nature around you teach you the secrets of occult knowledge. You will bypass the trappings of the tools on the table and go directly to what is most important, the truth that nature has to teach you. This is what the magician here is teaching you, that all of these tools on the table are useful for learning, but the real knowledge is on the ground and comes from underground. Now that you understand that knowledge can lie in places that are deceptive, you have met the person who keeps the keys to that knowledge. Here we have the High Priestess. The High Priestess holds the Torah in her hands and sits in front of a veil. The veil is covered in pomegranates, symbolizing the underworld, taking in the myth of Persephone and of Hades. The High Priestess shows you that there is a veil beyond that you have to go past to understand certain mysteries, to understand certain knowledge. And to be able to go beyond that veil, you must be prepared in certain ways. The High Priestess understands how to prepare you so that you can go on your journey to go past that veil and to understand the knowledge that lies behind it. 
the high priestess is not here to teach you how to part that veil. The high priestess is here to teach you how to prepare yourself before you part that veil, so that when you do part that veil and gain the knowledge that lies beyond the laws that you already know, you will not be shocked by it. Instead, you will be able to grow and flourish with it. Now that you are ready to grow, you must talk to she who is the queen of all that grows. The Empress has dominion over all of the Earth's resources, the growing resources, the grains, the trees, the waters. You can see the bounty behind her and before her, and she is very proud of all of it. Her robe is covered in designs of strawberries, and these are for the feminine and love arts. This is to show um, her symbolism aligning with Venus, which you can also see the symbol of here inside of the heart. The Empress is very upfront about what it is that she has the domain over. You can see it all in front of you. And what she is here to teach you is how to properly and wisely use the bounty that she is offering. The grain up front is not just a crop that one picks and picks and uses as one pleases. Grain must be used wisely if one is to keep having grain the next year and the next year and the next. The Empress is here to help you plan your growth, to help sustain your growth, to help make all of the growth of your life sustainable and all of the joys of your life sustainable. That is the wisdom that she offers so that you can continue on your path well-fed and well-resourced. Now that you are well-resourced, now that you are knowledgeable, now that you have been initiated into the secrets of how to use that knowledge, the Emperor is here to teach you how to handle power, because now you have power. The knowledge is power, the resources are power, and having all of them together means that you are indeed quite powerful, or you have the opportunity to become quite powerful. The Emperor is here to advise you on two things, how to wield power and how to hold power. Now, you can see in the Emperor's right hand, on the left side of the card, there is a rod. That is where the Emperor is holding power, or is wielding power. That is an implement for wielding power. Now, in the Emperor's left hand, on the right side of the card, he is holding an orb, and that is him holding power. Now, behind him are two mountains, and the taller mountain is the one that is on the same side as the orb that he is holding. Holding power is more important, is more powerful than wielding power. This is the lesson the Emperor is trying to teach you. That is why he is wearing armor. That is why he is sitting on his throne instead of at the forefront of a battle. He is in his kingdom, in his territory. He is in his stronghold. And he is teaching you that that is where you are the most powerful. That holding your power in check is the most powerful thing that you can do. Once you wield it and display it, there is no mystery anymore. People know exactly what it is that you have, and you are probably also not on your throne anymore. You have been taken off of it because now you have to go and wield your power. Hold your power. Hold steady. That is what the Emperor is trying to teach. The Emperor is all about securing your domain. You have been taught how to tap your intuition with the High Priestess. You have been taught how to manage your resources with the Empress, and you have been taught how to maintain your power with the Emperor. Now, you will be taught a new thing. The Hierophant will teach you how to unlock the mysteries of knowledge that is in code. This is what the keys at the very bottom of the card represent. Not only are, of course, all of the cards of the tarot called keys, you have the um, greater keys, and you have the lesser keys. Um, but the keys themselves here are essentially the keys to encryption. 
here is where you are taught how to decode the knowledge that has been sitting in front of you the entire time. What the high priestess did was teach you how to intuit it, how to simply know without knowing, how to get that feeling of what is there and what one should do without having to know the knowledge with one's own mind, the lessons of the subconscious. But here, the Hierophant teaches you the codes, the tricks, the secrets that unlock knowledge that has been sitting out here in front of you the entire time, but unable to be tapped. Of course, one thing that a priest typically shows up at is a marriage. And so we come to the next card, the lovers. The Hierophant has been teaching about the mysteries of bringing two things that are similar to each other but different together to create a greater whole. And here we have Adam and Eve in the garden about to create what we consider to be the rest of humanity. The Lovers is about making choices. It is about taking responsibility for those choices. And it is especially about embracing what it is that is for you, despite what anybody else's wisdom may say is to the contrary. Now that you've met your equal, you can make chemistry together. The Chariot is all about managing the chemistry of this new relationship that you've discovered to propel yourself forward and direct yourself where it is that you want to go. You can actually see on the shoulder pads of the rider here, we have these two crescent moons. One has a comedy face, one has a tragedy face. The Chariot has to balance between these different humors, these different moods. The chariot is about gaining control of your own emotions in the moment, whenever it is that you're using this power, and using that emotional control to propel yourself forward and to steer yourself where it is that you need to be. Instead of letting your car go out of control and crashing. A brief aside, I have renumbered two of these cards because there is some disagreement amongst tarot scholars whether or not justice should be in this slot here or strength should. I have reordered them from the Rider Waite Smith decks order to the other order that people usually use, which is the case in, say, the Crowley Thoth deck. That order is important here because now we have justice after the chariot. And justice is all about adjusting your course, adjusting your balance. Now that you have tried out a test ride and you've seen the results, is there something that you need to change? It is important to make changes now, to balance yourself out now, to make a diet of whatever it is that you need to cut out now, because the next step is going to require that you be not only perfectly in balance, but also perfectly in line with whatever it is that your internal ethos is. And so here is where you need to decide, is there anything that you need to change about how it is that you make your approach here? You've gone through your test drive. You've seen the results. Now you can make a change before you go to the next step, where it's going to be harder if you don't do this step. The next step is that you go it alone. In the Hermit, you have to find your own inner light by being the only thing there for you. The Hermit takes you out of society, out of civilization, and puts you alone to where you only have yourself, your own mind, your own conscience, your own intuition to guide you. It is a kind of trial, and in this trial, you face yourself. This is why it's good to see justice before you go through this, because if you already face justice before you go through your trial, you have nothing on your conscious need to worry about, and instead, you can simply ponder, what is illumination? What is your own light? You are the only person who can actually find and kindle this lantern inside of you. Sometimes fate teaches us a lesson. 
Here we have the Wheel of Fortune. It even has tarot right on it, so you know exactly what's going on. But if you start from the bottom instead, you can see that it also says rota, which is a rotation, a wheel. This is a cycle that goes over and over again, that begins anew and ends all of the time. You could call this a free spin on the Wheel of Chance. This is kind of a carnival game. You aren't actually going to lose, though. The point of the Wheel of Fortune is not to play the odds and see if you win the jackpot or lose everything. The point of the Wheel of Fortune is to learn. The wheel is spinning to see what lesson it is that you will learn this time. And if you are clever, maybe you can figure out a way to learn that lesson that works out very well for you. Sometimes there is no way to change the lesson. We simply take what fate deals us and we go from there. But the Wheel of Fortune is here to teach. That is why there are four different creatures, each in a corner, and all of them have books. This is where you come to learn. The thing about strength is that you don't know what your strength is unless you test it. And strength is all about a test. Sometimes it is a test to see whether you can hold the lion's jaws shut. And sometimes it is a test to see whether you, the lion, will refrain from biting the hand of those who are merely trying to comfort you. Strength is a test not to win or to fail, but simply to know how strong are you right now? And do you need to become stronger? Do you need to grow a different strength to be able to prepare yourself for what is to come? Now that you have tested your strength, you must test your endurance. This is why strength came before this card. It gave you an opportunity to be able to train yourself for this moment. This moment where you will simply have to endure, persist, and go through the experience. You can see here that the person's legs are in a figure four. Um, this is a reference to the god Jupiter. And this is also a clear callback to the card of the emperor. At some point, the emperor had to test his endurance to see if he was capable of ruling on that throne and now you are going through that same endurance test. This is about proving your mettle. It's about proving what it is that you have fundamentally on a certain level and knowing that you can go through the experience. This kind of initiation gives you an experience that cannot be conferred in any other way and is irreplaceable. And this kind of power only comes from going through that experience. This is how initiations work fundamentally. After you have gone through the experience, after you have gone through the initiation, the trial, you are no longer the same person. You are different. The hanged man, this is an initiation that makes sure that afterwards you are different than when you started. Now that you have changed, fundamentally changed on all levels, death is here to take you to the other side. Death comes whenever it is already our end, when it is already our time. Death is not here to end our time. It is simply here to bring us to our next time. All of these people are at their end, and they are all about to reach a new beginning, as you can see with the sunset in the background. The sun always rises again. Death is not about expiring. Death is about becoming something else, and that something else is on the other side of the veil. Only they will see it. It will remain a mystery to us for the rest of our lives. Now that your metal has been tested, you can perform the art of alchemy. Temperance is all about self-transformation. 
you have come to a place where you are now allowed to transform, and so now it is time to go through the procedure. Now it is time to go through the technician's dance that is self-transformation and self-adjustment. Temperance is a difficult card because it was difficult to get here, and it's going to be difficult from here on out as well. You could call it the calm, you could call it the eye of the storm, not the calm before the storm, but the calm in the center of the storm. Here is where you have all of the focus you need to do all of the magic that it is that you need to do, that you must do. And what's interesting about this experience is that usually these kinds of very calm, very engaged, very focused experiences in the occult are in the middle of either life events or magical rituals that are very tumultuous and chaotic. This is intentful, methodical, focused work, and it could not be done with any distractions around. The devil is the biggest distraction that you will ever deal with. The devil is not evil, it is not bad, it is not mean, it isn't even out to get you. The devil is simply a distraction. It's the wrong distraction at the wrong time. It's the one you don't need right now. And typically, what is needed to get past the devil, to be able to not have the devil befoul you and completely stop you from going forward, is to simply resist the temptation, take the chain off of your own neck, and walk away. The devil has no power over you that you don't give to it. That is the trade-off with the devil. The devil is not something that always has to be avoided, but it is a warning. Whatever it is that you are doing that the devil is talking to you about is probably enjoyable in some way. The devil is warning you that it will have to end at some point, and you will need to show restraint. You can see the chains on the card. The devil is all about restraint. If you show restraint, if you show deference towards yourself, if you show respect to yourself, then you will get through the devil just fine, because the devil has no power over you. You are the only one who has power over you. And that is here. With, that is what this card is here to teach you. Everything falls and everything ends. The tower is a reminder that we do not hold all of the cards, and we are not in control of this story. The star is a promise. It is a promise that everything around you is reality, that everything you are experiencing is real. Now there's an interesting thing about the star, and that's how different it is from the card Temperance, even though they look very similar. And I want to show you something about them. See here? This is Temperance. Temperance as water is not obeying gravity. It is going from one cup to the other diagonally. That's not possible. That's not physics. That's magic. But you, what you see here with the star is that gravity is operating perfectly. Because the star is actual reality. It is not magic. It is physics. It is the solid world around us. And it is here to stay. The moon rolls over the night when fears and anxieties come out to haunt us. This card can look something like a nightmare. It's really a puzzle about the mind itself. You can see two towers, one on the right and one on the left, looking very similar to each other. And you can see a road that divides the two. These two very separate lands that the moon overlooks. And these are the different hemispheres of the brain, the different sides of the mind. At the bottom there, you can see the crawfish or crab, depending upon the card that you're looking at in the art. That crustacean down there is referencing the base brain, the very low-level, instinctual, 
primitive brainstem between the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, and the brain stem, there are a lot of different impulses and automatic decisions and strange errors of thought that can arise because of their different perspectives. Neither of them can really see the perspective of the other because they're each stuck in their own side of the world. But the moon above is able to sleep through it all because it knows that there is only one mind, only one brain, and all of these are actually unified. The goal here is to model yourself off of the moon. Even though you're experiencing anxieties and worries, even though you're experiencing discord in your mind, remember that you are still one person and one mind, and you are unified within yourself. Let that help you sleep at night. The sun is free of all anxiety and concern because the sun can see through the eyes of a child. This is the state in which one no longer sees the world divided into left and right, into black and white, into these very, very difficult and hard binaries. This is a place where one can't see the world through the instinctual fears of a crustacean that swims away from the slightest hint of movement. These are the eyes of a child who can see the world in all of its glory with no fear, can simply take it all in with joy and cherish the experience. This is the goal of occultism, to bring the mind to this state where it can behold the majesty of all the reality around us without being afraid of it in any way. When true judgment comes, when the true end comes, we will not be afraid because we will know that there is nothing to fear. When the soul has finished its journey, it will be shed of all of the weight, of all of the guilt, of all of the loss that it has experienced before, and it will look forward to the next step in its journey with happiness, joy, and hope. You have it now. You've come to the conclusion. You have the world and you are complete. You are full. You are no fool. What is interesting, though, is that you can see on this card, there is an oval, a very big oval, and the figure in the middle of it almost represents a diagonal line through that oval, as if to say that this is almost zero, that the circle here is full, but you are close to being full that you are always one step away from being fool. And that is fine, because when we become fool, that means that we, be we can become empty again to be filled again. That is the wheel of the tarot, the never-ending circle, the ever-shuffling book. If you enjoyed this video, um, it'd be cool if you subscribed. I'd do other stuff on my channel. That's a lot like this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, um, and, um, I just, I like to talk about the tarot and different ways that you can interpret the wheel of the tarot, and, um, this was one way that I thought would be interesting to explain the journey that you take, the story that it tells. This in no way is meant to be a, uh, canon representation of exactly what the tarot means, or exactly what card breaks down into. This is not really a, a representation of any particular spirituality or path. This was simply a exploration of what the tarot can teach us in any given moment. And thank you for coming along for the ride. Cheers.